This week, super smart TVs have a flaw that lets attackers hijack the screens with uh, random videos. 20,000 Linksys routers leak historic records of every single device ever connected to them. A new attack creates ghost taps on Android smartphones. And an Australian teenager that hacked into Apple twice to try to get a job. In the expert commentary, we welcome Wynn Schwartow, a pillar of the community from the security awareness company to talk about ethical bias in artificial intelligence-based security systems. All that and more on this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Welcome to Hack Naked News, episode 221 for June 4th, 2019. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. I'm going to run through a couple of announcements and the news before we bring on our guests. Make sure you register for our upcoming webcast with SaltStack Domain Tools and Logarithm by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. If you've missed any of our previous ones, you can find them on demand at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. And now for the news. The Supra Smart TV flaw lets attackers hijack screens and pretty much play any video. Uh, the researcher discovered the vulnerability that could allow a local attacker to inject a remote file in the broadcast and display, uh, to broadcast and display fake videos without authentication. It should be noted that the attacker, at least the way the article put it, has to be on the same Wi Fi network as the TV. I would imagine this means you just need to be on the same network, wired or wireless. However, given the number of vulnerabilities in IoT devices and smartphones, it perhaps isn't impossible to gain access to someone else's television across the network. This reminds me, of course, of the movie Idiocracy, where TVs were filled with ads. That's where I foresee this one going. Uh, the super brand you may not have heard is a lesser known brand in Russia by a Russian electronics firm. Um, that manufacture several affordable audio and video equipment devices for household appliances, car electronics, distributing primarily in Russia, China, uh, and other uh, such countries. Um, I don't, this article was really horrible written. And that <laughs> somehow came through in the teleprompter. The vulnerability <laughs> is a remote file include due to the lack of authentication and session handling and according to the article, unlikely to be patched, which was kind of interesting. Uh, there's some JavaScript code that handles the video being played. Basically, there's no session handling or authentication for that particular function. So basically, you post a URL to it uh, with your video file, and that starts playing rather than what you're watching on TV. I've always thought that these kind of hacks would surface and be used for, for adware, essentially, uh, and to run commercials on your TVs, unbeknownst to you, or maybe beknownst to you, but unbeknownst to anyone else. The Cisco uh, service provider WebEx Bugs are offering up remote command execution. Cisco this week <clears throat> patched several bugs, including some high severity flaws. Uh, the CVE numbers are in the show notes. Uh, the ones that were interesting were with Cisco WebEx network recording player and the Cisco WebEx player for Windows, which could allow an attacker to remotely execute arbitrary code on an infected system. The bug is rated high severity instead of critical because it does require user interaction, but admins should patch as Cisco WebEx is a widely distributed software. And the article states the vulnerabilities exist because the software improperly validates advanced recording format or R files and WebEx recording format WRF files. Cisco reported on Wednesday. 
They could exploit these vulnerabilities via a link or email attachment and persuade the user to open the file in the infected system and gain administrative privileges and code execution. More than 20,000 Linksys routers are leaking historic records of every device ever connected. Independent researcher Troy Mersch said uh, the leak is a result of a flaw in almost three dozen models of Linksys routers. It took about 25 minutes for the binary edge search engine of internet connected devices to find 21,401, to be precise, vulnerable dice devices. That was on Friday. There's probably more, less, well, maybe a different number now. A scan earlier in the week found 25,000, which is interesting. Uh, they were leaking a total of 756,565 unique MAC addresses. Exploding this flaw only requires a few lines of code that harvest every MAC address, device name, and operating system that has ever connected to them. I didn't know they had that much storage on them, I guess. Well, compression's a thing. The flaw allows uh, snoops or hackers to assemble disparate pieces of information that most people assume aren't public. So this information could be used in future attacks by combining the historical record of devices that have connected to a public IP address. Marketers, abusive spouses, and investigators could track the movements of people any way they like. New attacks create ghost taps on modern Android smartphones. The attack itself is kind of interesting. It uses uh, NFC, it consists of two steps. The user has to place their smartphone near this attack rig which is very elaborate, and you can see pictures of it in the article. So you place it near this attack rig to be in a uh, range of NFC. Um, the article says 4 to 10 centimeters. That's going to depend on your environment and the chipset and any antennas you might have. The NFC readers writers can get basic information about a device and trigger one of three actions. It can make the user's smartphone open and access a specific URL which doesn't require any interaction from the user, can ask the smartphone to pair to a rogue Bluetooth device that does require interaction, or it can ask the user to connect to a malicious Wi-Fi network requiring interaction as well. This works because by default, Android devices always look for nearby NFC transmissions at all times. The majority of C-level executives expect a cyber breach this was a report from Dark Reading that says 9 out of 10 business leaders in the U.S. and U.K. say their organization lacks at least one critical resource necessary to defend against a cyber attack. What I have issue with is next, it says three quarters of those leaders believe a cybersecurity breach is inevitable. Why, why don't, isn't that 100% across the board? What happened to assume breach? This makes me very, very nervous. I think we need to do some education on assume breach. Uh, in our C-level executives, uh, especially those that participated in the survey and thought they weren't susceptible uh, or breach wasn't likely because you probably already are breached. An Australian teenager has hacked into Apple twice to try and get a job. And so kids, this is not how you get a job, especially at Apple. I mean, I want to single them out, but every company deals with security vulnerabilities differently. And if you're trying to hack into Apple to get a job, it's just not going to end well for you. I mean, for any company, but especially Apple, given the way that they, we've observed them handling security vulnerabilities. Now, the boy who's now 17 um, faced uh, charges in court and pleaded guilty to multiple computer hacking charges, according to the Australian ABC website. The court heard that he and another teenager, teenager from Melbourne hacked into the technology giant's mainframe in December 2015. I mean, now I'm kind of intrigued because if you're 17 and hacking or younger than that, hacking into mainframes, um, that's that's kind of cool. Someone needs to provide <laughs> this this youth some direction. Um, but then did it again in early 2017 and downloaded internal documents and data. The teenager is, uh, of course, from Australia and violated an Apple mainframe by creating false credentials. He was helped by another youth hacker. The lawyer of the teen, Mark Twiggs, explained to the court that this client had no bad intentions due to his young age and was not aware of the severe consequences, clearly needing some guidance from the security community. Mac OS has a zero date in Mojave that could allow synthetic click attacks. Patrick Wardle explained that subtle code signing issues in Mac OS could allow a hack of any trusted application to generate synthetic clicks by bypassing core security features introduced in 2018 by Apple. Malware developers and hackers might use synthetic mouse click attacks to emulate human behavior in approving security warnings. The attack could be triggered by an attacker with local access to the device when the screen is dimmed, which means it could be difficult to spot. 
We'll take a short break, come back with our expert commentary from none other than Win Schwartow. Stay tuned. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back to Hack Naked News. We welcome Wynn Schwartow from the security awareness company to talk about ethical bias in artificial intelligence-based security systems. And I love this quote, in Wynn's words, a trolleological conundrum of ethical bias and the failure of AI in security. Wynn, welcome to the program. Greetings, Howard. I loved your news program. I'm sitting here laughing, not <laughs> at you, but with the, with the whole way it's done. Oh, thank you. They see good news, and I really enjoyed it. It was, it's a, it was a lot of fun this week. It was some good articles. Um, I, and I love the SNL fix it, the way when, when their teleprompter oh, yeah. didn't work oh, yeah. for you. It was perfect. So what, what's interesting, when, when you and I, when we talk about, we catch each other in the hallways at, at various cons, um, and when we talk about AI, I tend to think of, you know, I'm a sci-fi fan, right? I watch Star Trek The Next Generation, and I think about data. When you talk about biases, whether they're ethical, gender, whatever the bias is, is that in the programming of the machine, or is it inherited from those that programmed the machine? Is kind of where, where I want to start. Does that mean if data was racist in some way were the creators because in star trek i they do a great job of being accepting of all different types of races for the most part you just asked 42 questions <laughs> i did i opened up a can of worms <laughs> um as security systems get what i call more anthro cyber kinetic we're combining the human element the cyber element and the physical elements together now we're starting to add AI on top of all this. The same questions that I question in that environment also apply to what we believe or some people think we're trying to do in the world of traditional cybersecurity. So first of all, with AI, keep in mind that AI has no memory. Key thing, there is no memory to go look up what happened, where are my data points, and come back with a binary determination, if you will. What AI is really good at is taking a huge data set and coming up with an approximation answer, a good probability. AI is about probabilistic, not deterministic results. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, too many of uh, vendors in a lot of fields are making it sound like AI is the answer, it's going to fix everything. But the bias that is introduced into any AI system comes from the initial data population in what's called supervised learning. Right. Garbage so in, garbage out. I'm sorry? Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, it's not garbage in, garbage out because there's the processing in the middle mm -hmm. changes every time you have an input. So I did this experiment with my wife. I was playing with one of uh, Google's uh, online deep brain thought thing. And I put a picture in of my wife and it came back a couple seconds later with kind of like Miro Picasso ish eyeballs everywhere. Cause that was the dominant feature that the AI picked up. I said, I wonder what's going to happen if I do this again in a minute, a different picture came back, mm -hmm. even though I had introduced the same picture. This is not deterministic. This is a guess. It's probabilistic. So when we're dealing with data sets, keep in mind that every single bit of your input will change what the thinking is in the middle. So when Microsoft introduced, I forget the name of the uh, chatbot, uh, it did on what, Twitter a few years ago? Mm -hmm. And within minutes, it was a racist because the initial population set may have had uh, some errors or people were sufficiently trolling it in order to modify how the AI was going to react to any given input. So trolling AI is an adversarial condition 
that we actually use in some training called generative adversarial networks, and it's primarily used right now in game theory. And is that really one of the flaws of AI today, right, is it can be influenced by external sources that could be under the control of various different people or things, right? It's a, any input, unless you've got real good access controls going on, which explains fake news and some of the social sure. media problems. If you have a large AI engine or an ML or deep learning engine that is supposed to give answers like, I like this book or you might want to watch this movie. Those are, again, suggestions based mm -hmm. upon your behavior and other people that they correspond or close to you. So they have a weighting factor in there. But if I suddenly changed my entire viewing habit, the AI would slowly shift. Mm -hmm. If a large population of people just said, let's go screw with Netflix, and everybody loves Ed Wood's, arguably one of the worst movies in history. How is that going to shift things? We see this when you've got the Microsoft issue of racist tweets. The most dominant case and the egregious one that I show in presentations is the labeling that occurs by presumptive AI. So if you go to Google, anybody can do this at home and begin a sentence in your Google search or whatever engine you're using that, and this is going to be offensive, so please do not all get upset, Jews should. And let's see what pops up underneath of it. And based upon the general population search terms, you're going to see some things that can be pretty horrendous. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It, it really means people still influence the... what we deem as artificially intelligent it's really its intelligence or ability to make decisions is based on input from humans in this case well they are acting exactly like humans in this case we are influenced by our surroundings by the conversations sure. we have uh we can get programmed our mind can be influenced uh, by lots and lots of information you get into the fake news issue you get into uh, the psycho uh, neuroscience of influence in mass media so we are exactly the same way that's why some people end up with opinions or wtf mate how do you come to that conclusion because of their external influences we can mm -hmm. ask the same thing of ai right right yeah it's interesting <clears throat> you know i'll have conversations with my brother-in-law and he's like well the world's gonna get taken over by robots right like this is his, his latest thing and i'm like dude like we're not there yet like they can help us make decisions, potentially make suggestions, I think is a very well put uh, statement when about how AI works today. But mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> many people think it, it's like how it happens in science fiction movies, that something is actually artificially intelligent, making decisions on their own and being self-aware, right? Would be two characteristics that we're a long ways away from. Oh, no, well, we can't even define what consciousness is or self-awareness is, so mm -hmm. let's not even go down that road for right now. Sure. Let's sure. look at the behavior of AI systems and how some of these ethical influences can occur. And that's why I go to the anthro-cyber kinetic mechanisms of robots, drones, self-driving cars. Because now that we have the kinetic component in all of these IoT-ish things that are going to keep rolling out without controls, how many people are really considering the ethical considerations of what happens in failure mode? Mm -hmm. So you have a drone. Drone's going along, and suddenly the drone's internal circuits say, oops, something's wrong. Where do I crash? Do I crash over here through a window where it's unknown how many people are on the other side? Or do I crash on the street with the two little old ladies underneath the umbrella? How are those decisions made? Mm. When you have... a automobiles that are running around the streets, they still have to, trouble to st uh, distinguishing between real people and very high quality images on the sides of buses is a prime mm -hmm. example. When something goes wrong, failure mode, how do you program the ethical considerations for failure mode? And this is what gets into the trolley illogical conundrum. The basic trolley problem says there is a trolley out of control. And it is running down the tracks, and it's going to hit 
five people. However, you are on next to the switch, and if you pull the switch, you will not kill five. You intentionally now will kill one. What do you do? Now, what if you have one person on one track, zero people on the other track, yet the trolley's going to kill the one person, but there's a big guy on the bridge. Do you push the guy over the bridge in order to save a life mm. or not? These are the same kinds of questions that we are, have to address with all these anthro-cybernetic systems. But now let's take these ethical questions and put them in the context of the culture of India, uh, China, different cultures around the world, perhaps a, uh, a very strict Muslim uh, society. Are those ethical decisions going to weight equally in all of them? Right. And how does Tesla or Google, how do we distribute all of these technologies unless we really understand the ethics of failure mode? And the perfect example of failure mode is when you're in an elevator, something goes wrong, it puts on another set of brakes. It invokes a new system. Mm-hmm. We don't have that with AI because we don't know how AI works. Right, right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I love talking with AI with you, Wynn. It's just so fascinating and, and eye-opening. And for those that want to learn more, you've written a book. Oh, oh, this is time for Crash Commercial Crash Commercial. <laughs> yeah, Analog Network Security uh, redefines uh, security uh, with no zeros no ones, and it turns it into analog functions that allow you to actually measure security, measure the efficacy of security products, and measure how your network is performing. And then there are schematics and approaches to get rid of phishing, spam, DDoS, by merely thinking of networks and security in an analog domain instead of a binary digital domain. Fantastic. And when are you speaking uh, on this topic? You spoke at RSA, correct? Yeah, I've spoken at RSA. There were a few others in there. Tomorrow, I'm going down to Huntsville for one of them. Then I'm over in uh, Netherlands giving some talks to the Dutch government and a couple of other groups. Down to France, going to be with a couple of uh, DEF CON groups, mm -hmm. Hack in Paris, and then I'm out to San Francisco, and then I stay on the road. Awesome, awesome. Well, if you have a chance to catch up with Wynn, I strongly advise you to do so uh, as it's a, a great topic that I think it has to be discussed today as more and more we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence as it applies to our security products. It, of course, applies to technology and society as a whole on a global scale, which is which is interesting. I had never considered the cultural facets of all the different you know countries and cultures and how that would play into an AI system. So, Wynn, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it and hope to do it again. Fantastic. And when you, your role at, uh, is uh, Chief Visionary Officer at the Security Awareness Company, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash SAC. Thank you so much, Wynn. Thank you. With that, we'll take uh, not a short break. We're actually, this concludes the show. And thank you to everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.